This forgotten tech makes superhumans. Coat your collarbone in it, and your collarbone will now be able to hold up to 4,400 pounds. If you coat all of your bones in it, you'd be a real life Wolverine. It's real life adamantium. But what is it? Could it really be used to turn ourselves into superhumans, enhancing our bones to be indestructible? Well, it's actually nanotechnology. It's what they call a nanotech alloy. And this tech has mostly been forgotten. I mean, just look at this chart of interest in nanotechnology over time. It peaked all the way back in 2004. Why? Well, the reason actually starts with this guy. This is Eric Drexler. Okay, so it's 1986 and nobody has heard of nanotechnology. Nobody except for a handful of scientists who work in the space of nanotechnology, of course. And one of those scientists is Eric Drexler. He writes a book called Engines of Creation and in it, he makes some insane predictions like world altering predictions. Some utopian, but also some dystopian. The point is that a lot of people thought that these were insane, that they were never gonna actually happen. But then they started to come true. One by one, Drexler was right. Let me show you what I mean. Drexler predicted that tiny materials would be found and created at the nanoscale, aka the very, very small scale. Materials that are extremely strong and or lightweight. And then the discovery of those materials would launch the field into further advancements. Now at the time, this seems crazy. You're just gonna stumble upon random materials that are extremely strong and lightweight for their size. But then it happened. Sure enough, in 1991, carbon nanotubes were discovered. And these are minuscule structures with insane strength. And then that laid the foundation for nanomaterials research. Drexler predicted the nanotechnology would be used to rapidly advance computing. And in 1993, the first single electron transistor was created, showing the potential for nanoscale devices to revolutionize computing. I mean, the list goes on on and on. And so eventually people start to pay attention. They're like, maybe this Drexler guy knows what he's talking about, including the Green Goblin, you know, from Spider-Man. You and I are not so different. In 2002, Spider-Man hit theaters and guess what plays a role in Norman Osborn's transformation into the Green Goblin. That's right nanotechnology. I read all your research on nanotechnology. Really brilliant. See, Norman Osborn is using nanotechnology in his work to develop a serum that will create superhuman soldiers. He injects himself with the serum and well, I think you know the rest. So by this point, hype for nanotechnology and pop culture was well on its way to its peak. Breakthroughs in the field were happening left and right and Hollywood was fully embracing it. But it wasn't just Hollywood that was obsessed with nanotechnology, governments were ready to get behind the movement as well, especially the United States. If more of Drexler's predictions were gonna come true, the US was gonna be the one to make it happen. Or at least that's what I can imagine was in their minds as they launched things like the US National Nanotechnology Initiative in 2000. This was launched, which immediately received tons of funding. And it used that funding to invest in all sorts of nanotechnology projects. Like nanoparticle drug delivery medicine constructed using nanotech that allows it to travel to a specific part of the body to target tumors while limiting harm to the rest of the body. Or what about all of modern computing? Modern semiconductors rely massively on nanofabrication, the fabrication of very tiny objects, allowing us to create transistors for computers just five nanometers long. By the way, to put that in perspective, a red blood cell is 7,000 nanometers long. So yeah, insanely small stuff that wasn't possible without people like Eric Drexler. So you've got new discoveries, you've got movies, debates, startups, all in the nanotech space. It seemed like this technology would transform the world in no time. But then this happens. Why? Grey goo. That's your answer. Grey goo. That's the actual term used to describe a particularly scary scenario involving nanotech. See, it's a dystopian concept brought to light by none other than our man, 
Eric Drexler. So, Greg Goo, imagine an advanced nanobot with the ability to replicate itself at the molecular level. These nanobots could, in theory, create copies of themselves by rearranging atoms. And if you think about it, this could actually be incredibly useful. Imagine a nanobot that could break down plastic, replicate itself to the scale needed each time it found a large plastic patch in the ocean and then dissolve itself and all of its copies when the task is complete. It would be incredibly revolutionary technology. But gray goo, remember, is a dystopian theory. Well, that's because there is a chance that we would lose control of these nanobots, allowing them to replicate uncontrollably, endlessly, consuming all resources in the entire Earth uh, and ending all life as we know it. See, the theory is they would continue to consume organic and inorganic material until Earth's biosphere was completely destroyed. So what's the point? Well, with all the advancements being made, all the theories that Drexler got right, surely Grey Goo was just around the corner or some miracle equivalent technology that would propel us into utopia. But then it just didn't happen. No gray goo, no miracle nanobots that would cure cancer. Instead, nanotech quietly became the unsung hero behind better batteries, better computing, and stronger tennis rackets. Useful? Definitely. Mind-blowing? Not so much. Fast forward about 20 years from 2004 and we are finally creating some of this incredible technology predicted by Drexler and other nanotech experts. Now, one of the most exciting innovations out of all this is Nanovate. It's a material that could make you invincible. So it's a nanotech alloy and it's created by a company called Integron. Now they're a massive player in the nanotechnology space. They've worked with big names like NASA, Boeing, and SpaceX. They do a bunch of stuff with nuclear. They know what they're doing. You know why I know that? Because if you coat a ping pong ball, just 300 microns thick, about the width of three human hairs, that ping pong ball can now hold 200 pounds. In fact, if you go to Integron's lobby, they have this very ping pong ball on display doing just that. And you'd think this material would weigh a lot to support the extreme strength, but this is nanotech we're talking about. This actually weighs next to nothing, 17 grams. And by the way, it's not just a little stronger than other metals, it's a lot stronger. It has an ultimate tensile strength of 1600 megapascals. And I know that means nothing to you, it means nothing to me either, but to give you a point of reference, stainless steel sits at around 600 megapascals. That 1600 megapascals equates to around 232,000 pounds per square inch that this material could support. That means that if you were to take a tiny one inch cube of this stuff, you could place 16 fully grown African elephants on it and it still would not be crushed under all that weight. An inch, an inch. Now what most definitely would crush under all that weight is our bones. Our femur, for example, has an ultimate tensile strength of just 135 megapascals. That thing's not holding up to a single elephant, let alone 16 of them. So what is this nanovate and how does it work? Well, it's a nanocrystalline metal. So think of metals as being made up of tiny grains, just like kind of like the texture of sand. Each grain is a small chunk of the metal's crystal structure. In regular metals, these grains are relatively big, sometimes large enough to see under a basic microscope. But in nanocrystalline metals, the grains are super, super small, measured instead in nanometers. The grains on these nanocrystalline metals are a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair. But why does grain size even matter? Well, it has a huge impact on how metal behaves. Smaller grains mean a stronger metal. That's because the boundary between these grains act like barriers that prevent bending and deforming of the metal. 
more barriers mean a stronger, harder metal. And nanocrystalline has so many more grain boundaries that it's way harder for cracks to spread or for the material to bend. And then we can coat these metals on any item you please by a process called electro deposition. We don't have to go into the details of that process, but it's a super cool method in which they use electrolyte liquid solution and electricity to control exactly how metal forms around an object. It's a cool topic, but you know, maybe one for another video. So let's go back to the question of, could you actually use this stuff to make your bones indestructible? Well, a YouTube channel named Hacksmith Studios did exactly that. He took the exact models of his collarbone and created a variety of coats to test the strength of each. Some were left just as the material similar to the strength of bone as a baseline test. Others were coated in traditional metals like copper and steel, and others were coated in Nanovate. And the result results are mind boggling. See, here's what happened. Regular bone broke when just 133 kilograms or 292 pounds of force was applied to it. The collarbone with the strongest alloy of Nanovate, it broke when 2,163 kilograms or 4,768 pounds of force was applied to it. That's 16.4 times stronger than regular bone. And remember, this coating is super light. Coating your entire skeleton in this stuff would only make you around 30% heavier, but it would make you 16 times stronger. Put that in perspective, that means you could theoretically put the weight of 104 barbell plates on your back and squat that weight without your bones breaking. It's honestly hard to even fathom. Now could we actually coat our bones in this stuff? Well. Maybe, but since it's applied using that electro deposition technique that we talked about, we couldn't using modern technology, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't still make superhuman. You could simply instead coat clothing or armor or make some sort of exoskeleton with this stuff. And suddenly you've got an ultra strong, ultra protecting device or article of clothing. You could make indestructible phones, bikes, cars, jewelry, sunglasses, you name it. Once the technology becomes more widespread, you could even pair it with a 3D printer and literally create anything you'd like at home with the strength of a professional manufacturing factory from years past. It's truly incredible, exciting stuff. And I hope this video has got you just as excited about it as I am because it could really change the world. Thanks for watching.